But I had set up looks and I would go in and I would, I often ask while people are editing um, whether I could do a day's work um, and get things going uh, early on. And um, it, not so much for this film, but for other films, it gives VFX an idea of where something, so that then they don't get used to something that they don't, um, they're not going to see in the end. Just a, a little bit on that, and, and uh, maybe a bigger film, for example, like Cinderella. Um, there are so many preview grades um, and audiences seeing it that instead of seeing it as a, although it's not the scanned images and the final uh, resolution that you'll be working on, even taking your dailies and doing uh, and being actively involved as a cinematographer in the preview grade, for me is a useful uh, uh, tool. Um, I found that both on Jack Ryan and on Locke and on Cinderella, I've managed to create the look early on um, and in subsequent preview grades when I was not available, give people something to work with and we've done our final grade based on that. We may have started from scratch, scanned everything and you lose every, but it's to have a picture there that says what it is I want it to look like. For me, doing it with this approach is far more correct for me than trying to grade on set while shooting, you know, uh, at the most inappropriate time, um, using words and not being there on a desk, looking at an image and having something concrete to uh, work from. I'm not going to ask too many more questions because there are others, but I'd just like to point out that you're, you're, you're well known for many things, but certainly your collaboration with Kenneth Branagh. But talk us through your relationship with this director, how that came about and how, how your discussions went prior to the shoot. Um, I basically, Guy Healy was, who produced this, was the best first assistant director I'd ever worked with. We'd actually worked with Kenneth on Sleuth together and on Death Defying Acts. Um, and he then became a producer. He produced Steve's first film. Uh, Steve is a fantastic writer. He created shows like um, uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? He wrote uh, Dirty Pretty Things. He's a very diverse uh, writer. And he had made a film, uh, a low-budget film called Hummingbird, um, which Chris Mengus uh, shot, and shot beautifully. I mean, to Great film, actually. Steve's first film was fantastic. Um, in that, they had done some testing for night shooting with, with Chris. And Steve was quite amazed. They actually shot with an Alexa. And uh, Chris was amazed at uh, what you could achieve. And Steve was amazed by that, too. So when they wrapped, he wrote this screenplay in two weeks and said, I just want to shoot inside a car with one person. And I know I can do it. And I, I, I think I've got a great idea that's a human story. And that immediately got me, my head kind of, wow, what a great concept. And Steve said many things that really touched my heart. He said, I want to do a film where no one gets killed. It's an everyday tragedy. This could happen to anyone. It's about dealing with life um, and that anybody could do. I think any film student could make this film. I think any first time or frustrated director who just can't get a big film going could sit there and think about a concept that could be made quickly um, and eloquently and have something to say and um, doesn't require, you know, um, 200 million dollars to make and uh, preview screenings and uh, etc. And it could touch people's hearts. And that's the kind of conversations we had with uh, Steve. I would then kind of go out there, do some testing, figure some things out, come back to him. He'd look at them and we'd discuss it further. Um, but it was, he directed this through sound. Um, the, the word is so important and actually Kenneth does this too. And Kenneth says, we always have a read through with Kenneth before a, a film. And he says, we will do what Shakespeare always did, which is we will listen to this screenplay. And it's very important, even for a cinematographer, to listen to the screenplay. Um, it gives you tremendous clues about um, uh, what the emotional content is. And I think you have to then uh, create images that are either in harmony or not in harmony um, with these 
uh, words. I had the feeling that it gave you even the rhythm sometimes, no? Absolutely, yeah. completely. Um, I found myself um, not looking at the monitor um, and putting my head down and listening, um, and it it would give me an idea of, uh, and it would give me an idea about well, I've got three more minutes till this card is going to go. What am I going to do next? Um, uh, and it was actually easier to think of some of these things by not looking at what you were creating as an image at that moment, and easier to see it by listening to it. Did you some tests with uh, non-anamorphic lenses as well? Um, I did, and I just like the oval uh, um, ellipses, yes. <laughs> uh, I can't... I've tried, I have to say, um, I'm addicted to anamorphic lenses. It's, uh, uh, if there was an anamorphics anonymous, I'd probably be um, the first in the club. I've tried kind of enjoying spherical lenses as much. Um, it just, uh, I think it's, I can't describe it, I think it's, uh, it's something you, you know, I'm like a big Roger Deakins fan, he hates anamorphics. It, it's a, uh, I think it's a personal um, interpretation. Yeah, it's no need to hate them. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I was sometimes a bit tired from that effect. You understand? Because yes. it's, it's a technical effect. It's not natural seeing. That was my question. It, I think, with, I think you would, we would have probably gotten the same amount of Boca an out of focusness with a spherical lens, especially at those light levels. But it would be circular, yes. Um. Hello. Hello there. Uh, regarding uh, your collaboration with the director, I would like to ask to what degree you had established specific shots according to the drama of the script. Let's say that in this specific dialogue we'll be shooting in this specific setup, or mostly the the whole film was uh, made in the editing room. Uh, you know, I'm sure that he had a lot of shots with uh, reflections and flares that uh, probably they will uh, give a specific tone to specific lines of drama, so that the the editor would choose them. So, to what degree the film was done specific scenes? in the shooting or in the editing? That's my question. Oh, they, well, in the editing, they choose what they like, but there were specific shots. Given the structure of three nights of this, uh, 26 minutes, you basically have um, three to four changes per night. So you can do the maths. It's about 12, uh, 12 to 14 shots per night. Um, and yes, there was a structure to how um, that would be. Um, if a mistake happened, and we'd have to stop the car, I'd always maybe stay on the same uh, angle but change the lens size just to con constantly mix it up. Um, we were very conscious about the dialogue to his father and making that as abstract as possible. Um, and we were conscious of, but of kind of doing a head-on shot as well for like somewhere in all of these three setups that there was something that was from the front windshield. Um, the nuances of that we worked out on the spot. Um, but we definitely had a structure uh, uh, to what we worked on. The problem was that Tom did three different performances on three different nights. So the the performance that you see, which is 80 to 90 percent, is from the first night. It usually always is from the first take, and it is his mildest. I mean, he did some takes where he'd have like a handkerchief hanging out of his ear, where he just wanted to show that he was really going insane with all, all of this. Um, and however interesting it seems in the moment, you, I think you have to, and this in a way answers a little bit of Christian's question, is how, do you, where do you, how far do you go with these things and what makes it timeless and what becomes just too much? And yes, I think in some instances, um, it is too much, and that stops it from being timeless. But I think given our situation and our environment, we didn't really have a lot of choice um, in all of that. It's okay. I had once that impression when, uh, I don't know when it was a hot 
<coughs> in the dialogue a hard moment, she said, you will never come back home and bonk the camera shakes and things yeah. like that. That was by chance. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Uh, uh, you could hit the tripod yeah, or something. Uh, no, on the low loader, it was all by chance. We, um, I'm not, I think there's some people in the back that might have some questions. Do you want to? But yes, completely. Everything Christian was by chance in this, in this situation. Um, even when the camera goes a little lower, um, it got knocked. Um, but it's such a claustrophobic film that uh, we went with it. Um, and it kind of I th it maybe gave a sense of urgency, as opposed to the really shaking the camera and trying to make it feel urgency. I think what we had is something that was created by the situation. Um, here, uh, bloody good movie, uh, excellent work. Uh, what I wanted to ask you, you have a, a, a concrete man. He's the man who made one flaw uh, decision in his life and it all fell down. And in the movie, the, the space is quite ambiguous. You have all these longitudinal planes, but you have a very uh, shallow uh, depth of field and I uh, from your answers I, I saw that you did the, this on purpose but how did you went from the script from this man who has to who is in a, um, uh, on a trip to his destruction so to say or his renewal I don't know uh, how did this uh, go through your mind and uh, Transform into these images and to these techniques with the with the three D uh, mirror that you put in front with the dimmers, or was it all because you had such a great fun shooting it? Did it came in the moment? It's a road trip, really. So it, ca it can only be that. I think uh, I may have enhanced certain things, but there's nothing I did in there that isn't in the landscape that he's. He belongs to. He's not on his construction site. He is for a moment, and the shots are a little more structured. But the minute he leaves, um, it, it's a bit of a free-for-all. And it is a bit of a free-for-all. You, you, know, you just don't know what will happen. I think you have to go with your gut feeling at those, at those moments. And um, uh, I think you, to some extent, be unapologetic about it. The only thing that you have to be responsible to afterwards is the story and how you what choices you make and those are the directors and the um, and the editors um, basically they had more mild images um, they chose not to use them um, there was always a safety uh, angle they chose not to use them and I uh, suppose you had your camera rigged on the uh, on the uh, motor of the car, uh, not on the on the outside of the car. That's why it trembled on some shots, or was that? It was both inside the car and outside the car. We oh, did both. Okay. And, um, and handheld as well. Okay. Inside the car. Right. And was the vision clear from the beginning? For me, it was, and for the director, it was. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, was the shooting done linearly according to the script or were they like grouped like when you were shooting uh, him talking to his father through the mirror were those all shots grouped together to be shot each night or uh, were they linearly like uh, when they occurred during each, uh, each uh, uh, plan? We each definitely time. did the whole script from beginning to end including the dad's dialogue. In some of this we then did the dialogue to the dad additionally on the fourth day that we had Tom um, driving the car. There were certain shots, like looking into the uh, rear view mirror, where you would see the low loader behind you. So you, you can't shoot into the windshield on the low loader. So those were done um, the, uh, another day. And also the shots looking into the side view mirrors um, were uh, done on that day too.